Welcome back everyone to Tio No, the last days of Europe, which you know by now, by episode 7, I mean, you probably know that by now. Uh, Germany's apart, and I'm your host, uh, Mr. Ocean Lover, or Mr. Mocha Lover, or Mr. Mexico Lover. But, we have quite a bit to read, and as one of the comments said from yesterday, where this is like the 7th episode and we're still in 1963. Holy cow, the first posting. Or Dodds had approximately waited 30 seconds after knocking before deciding to come to visit Alfonso Coronia de Rosal's Rosal's office later instead. As he turned away from his good friend's doorstep hour, the door swung open to reveal the grinning president of the PRI. Ordaz, come in, my friend. Over a cup of coffee, the two caught up over recent events, with Del Rosal congratulating Ordaz on his expected ascendancy to the presidency. El Titan, however, quickly got to the point, as the days leading up to the inauguration had his schedule filled. Del Rosal, Ordaz cracking a rare genuine smile, I am offering you the position of Secretary of National Patrimony in my administration. Under my administration, we could return this country to a stability promised by the revolution and the party, and that is not possible without someone I can, I can trust in charge of a prized energy sovereignty. Ordaz leaned in closer. This position would also see your career in the party be propelled to new heights, should you accept. Del Rosal quickly accepted. If not even up to question, a uh, licenciado, I would be honored. The position is sealed. Our rising star in the party, and who, who does he remind me of? Afray. See you tomorrow, Camila. Her friend left the uh, class as she was sluggishly packing her many notes into the backpack. What is a celebratory time of class for most in the end? Instead brought Camila Alvarez down as it was her daily vacation away from home had ended. Jose and Rodrigo would be home today and she was not eager to face her wrath that they were in a bad mood. She approached her typing teacher. Professor Aguirre, could you give me feedback on my assignment please? Of course sweetheart, just wait outside for a moment while I talk to Professor Cruz next door. As Camilla leaned beside the door, she overheard the conversation through the porous and walls. You're part of the strikes, Professor Cruz. I don't take you for a rail worker. It was a solitary strike of the teachers' union. 58, 59, we felt unstoppable. That was until our dots cracked down. Though I managed without injury, I had a few colleagues arrested, tortured even. Professor Aguera's flirty demeanor quickly faded as she began reminiscing as well. Likewise, friend, at likewise. As for me, I think I'm going to keep my head down. That ugly guy seems to be cracking down harder every year. Best to lie low until it gets what's coming to him. Quiet with all that talk, Aguera. You should probably get back to your student anyways. I think she's waiting outside. Paternalism permeates all levels. Con esos enemigos. enemigos. Ah, I feel like a gosh darn hero. A real man. Fas kundo otis bello. That'll show you, stupid Bolshevik. You rather unimaginatively jeered at the fleeing students carrying away those who had made unable to walk. Calming himself down with the next engagement, Facundo wiped the blood off his brow. Thank God a Mario wasn't obvious on my shirt. He remembered entering the cafe where the next appointment was. Two plain clothes police officers, his classmate from school, were taking their ease, polishing off bowls of carne and su jugo so barbarically that Facundo wouldn't have guessed them for officers if he hadn't already known. One of them looked up just long enough to point with his eyes to an inconspicuous uh, suit clad man before returning to massacring his lunch. The man nodded almost imperceptibly. As Facundo sat down, the man handed him an envelope which he gracefully accepted. Got something else for you too, Mr. Ortaz, Ortiz. Thank you for your service thus far, but there's more. Well, go on. If there's some more of these uh, communists and socialists have something unfortunate happen to them, we could see our way to our forward to a swift release for your colleagues in Los Tecos. Not only appreciative, a Facundo shook on it. That I can arrange, he said, taking his leave. Next in Ortiz is Rodo Rolodex, guarding a PNM patriotic rally, a perfecting democracy. The electoral law in 1963 had conquered newsstands across the country. Headlines roar, electoral law strengthens democracy, the PRI makes room for opposition, and your vote matters more than ever. Even the pan affiliated newspaper of the nation offered reprise to the reform, albeit with a focus on Christ Liebs or Christ Liebs role in its creation. If eyes descended below those headlines, however, they encountered a more complex picture. The previous regionally based system was maintained, but now some seats in the chamber deputies were to be filled by parties in proportion to the votes they received. Astute readers might realize that two of the three parties to benefit were effectively controlled by the PRI, only existing to engage the far left in uh, chaotic electoral ventures. Others might claim that the PAN, the only true opposition, would be no opposition to challenge a PRI even should they receive the maximum of 20 seats provided for under the new rules. Uh, but why listen to all those shrill voices when millions of Mexicans go about their day content that big block letters proclaim their democracy is fair and just? I just read it for the comics. Nice. Well, reform strength of legislative elections. Oh, look at that. The deer would be proud of how far we've come. 
this house? Oh. With the votes of all 60 institutional revolutionary party senators, 172 congressmen, and five National Action Party congressmen, the Congress of the Union has unanimously passed a constitutional amendment strengthening the access of opposition parties to the federal legislature. In any subsequent legislative elections, minority parties winning at least 2.5% of the national vote will be awarded five seats automatically, receiving five seats more for each additional 0.5% of the vote they receive, up to a total of 12 in these seats. Let's let our piece of legislation has given our new representation to the diverse voices of our country and is a powerful symbol uh, for of our government's commitment to Mexico and our democracy. Madero will be proud of how far we've come. Yeah, there you go. So, what do we got here? Not much. We're pulling ahead. Um, poverty's looking better. It's November 21st. Oh, I have a little bit of money here. That's right. I have that a little bit. Not terrible. Not terrible. Hopefully, keep it up. The world's exploded. Cool, cool in Norway. And we're skies and seas enjoying. So, if you're going to read this again, please go ahead. I think I might want to go down this way, perhaps? Ooh, we get better poverty immediately, though. And a hospital. Three hospitals. That's pretty good. More DFS loyalty. And bureaucracy and power. Loyalty is not bad. We could stand to get more from it. Give these more power to bureaucracy immediately, though. I'll give this one next. Hmm. Reprisal. Or from Article 123. I'm maybe we'll do this one just because we get better poverty immediately. Send it IMSS. At Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social is our conduit, um, through which we are able to give the average person a helping hand. Well, the primary tool in the arsenal is providing welfare. The toolbox is full of another. Um, of, full of other public health initiatives that are more than happy to make sure that they keep on providing. Building new hospital infrastructure, battling diseases, rolling out vaccinations, and many more positive initiatives. It's a massive no-brainer to continue providing them with the resources that they need, and a massive victory for Mexicans far and wide, and the pursuit of living well you can never put in too much. All for a purpose. What the heck are we doing this even for? They threatened to fire us before. But what, what if we didn't show up and Victor began, but was interrupted by one of the other railway workers? Not show up, and what? Get screwed over by the bosses yet again? Man, I need the stupid money for my family. I can't go be screwing around yet again, especially over speech. Silence fell on the group as they shuffled their way towards a crowd standing before a ramp, small ramshack stage made specifically for this occasion. The growth's a little better now, finally good. Ladies and gentlemen, your president, Adolfo Lopez Mateos. The leader of the Mexican people, Lopez Mateos, stepped onto the stage. He gave his signature grin to the crowds and cheered his arrival. Most were enthusiastic, only with a splattering of subdued celebrations such as those of the railway workers, and yet the energy that exploded at the start of the, real, start of the rally did not dissipate. As Lopez Mateo spoke, talking about bringing prosperity to the Mexican worker through solidarity and economic security, the workers found themselves pulled along with the rest of the crowd as they allowed the president to guide them towards the shining future he envisioned. All of us will one day look forward to a future where our wants are seen to, our needs looked after, and our social ills dispelled. And we may only see this future if we do all we can as necessary and play our part in carrying out the ideals of the Mexican Revolution. As Lopez Mateo continued, the topic on the minds of the railway workers was not the strike that had been broken mere weeks ago. Instead, it was about Lopez Mateos. Uh, and what they might be able to do in this fight for justice, equality, and liberty. The smile paints over the cracks. So we got a few things here. Uh, I, I like better unemployed. That's good. Yeah. I'm going to hang on to the political power for now. Fruits of success. Uh, uh, Lazaro Cardenas. Uh, Gilberto Rinson and the rest of the movement for national liberation were dizzy with success. After going public with their plans, they challenged the CNC with the creation of the Independent Peasant Control, or CCI. The ranks began to swell at an incredible pace. The real sign of success was when the PRI started to take them seriously. Organizations were broken up and closed skeletons, or closeted skeletons, came to light, yet the movement marched on, encouraging Cardenas and its supporters. So Cardenas spent much of his time speaking to Mexican peasants who were signing up for both the MLN and the CCI in droves. They spoke about how they felt seen by Cardenas and his organizations. They told him how they were happy to see the true spirit of the Mexican Revolution live on. However, it was one topic that made Cardenas uneasy. Elections. Many Mexican peasants expressed hope that the MLM would contest the upcoming elections. Every time Cardenas gave him a canned response about how it was still too early to make such decisions. Internally, though, he was worried. He didn't see the MLN as ready for such an act, yet his supporters did have, he have, did have, were beginning to grow expectations. And nothing is more dangerous than expectations. I like more stability and protection of our people. 
at face value, a behemoth party like the PRI might suggest some draconian beasts as controlling Mexico, united in ideology and thought while crushing those who do not adhere to the party line. Such a way of thinking couldn't be further from the truth, of course. The PRI's dominance has given the way for its currents of thought to run through it, and indeed we're quite proud that our current administration is in fact the most left-leaning that the party has been since the time of President Cardenas. We accept more conservative elements in the party and the opposition of the PAN, but this is because they adhere to the democratic process and stand within the Constitution. What is not acceptable is that those who defy these ranges blatantly, totalitarianism, radicalism, groups with no regard for democracy and what it stands for, it is in this national interest of every Mexican to put our forces on guard against these kind of threats and to protect the, against the subversion of peace. R slash I, real irritation. Uh, Lupito ran across the deserted hospital lobby and crashed through the door shoulder first. The cool air of the Saltillo now did little to soothe their burning lungs as she ran down the street. Just a block away, the last bustle and I idled at an empty bus stop. Crap, the, the driver was already closing the door. Lupita shouted, but it was no use. The diesel engine roared and black smoke spewed from the exhaust as the bus rolled away into the cold desert night. Lupita leaned against a door of the darkened storefront and stretched her aching legs. She hadn't expected or planned on expecting and picking up an additional shift at the hospital after a full day's work, but she knew what happened to interns who left bad impressions on their employers. There's no sense in throwing away her future over one night. She walked out down the silent street and dragged herself through the doors of the hospital. The receptionist gave her a quizzical glance before turning back to her magazine. Lupita thought about asking her to phone a cab before dismissing the idea. Her form to pay so monthly stipend barely covered rent and was food as it was. Better save the money for a real emergency. Lupita wandered through the empty white halls of the hospital before arriving at a storage room in her unit. Inside were rows upon rows of steel gurneys. She collapsed onto the closest one. Sleep did not come quickly, nor did it stay for long. The frigid hospital air and her aching back made sure of that. Lupita awoke before dawn and got to work reviewing patient charts for the day. Man, oh man. How are the workers looking? Peasantry not looking good. Not a good thing they don't have a lot of power. Workers are okay. The Union State. <laughs> the Confederación de Trabajadores de México, despite the misgivings of some, is Mexico's primary workers' union and a firm friend of ours. They have often th a thankless task of cooperating with said workers and maintaining an agreeable balance between the standard of work and the standard of living, keeping a wrangle on forces that could pose a potentially revolutionary threat and ensure they are, remain pliable. The CTM are not Mexico's only union, but we have certain distaste for many of the others, existing on the edge of radical policies, our politics, and exposing dangerous anti-democratic ideals, fascism, communism, and the familiar troublemakers who we cannot tolerate. We must put out a message and let everyone know that the CTM has more than earned our blessing as the op best option for the Mexico's workers. Curbing the radicals. Are we ready to move in, sir? One of the officers asked as they stood watching the slowly approaching crowd of protesters, shining slogans like Tierra y Libertad. I know such phrases commonly tossed around radical land reformist circles. Now yet, Omar replied, the chief hasn't given the go ahead. Why he hadn't, Omar couldn't say. He overheard the arguments between the chief and the la local landowners before. Um, <clears throat> usually managed to the chief talking about the risks of creating a public disturbance and local landowners arguing that the protesters were the public disturbance. Usually the landowners went out, and this time it would be no different. Omar's radio crackled to life, and once he heard the signal, he shouted, advance. All of the officers gathered knew exactly what that meant. Equipped with the batons and rifles, they marched forward and met the protesters head on. The two waves crashed into each other, but as always, the officers were stronger. Screams of pain filled the street as the sun scrambled to get away. The hammer of the law beat them into the pavement. As Omar looked over the scene before him, um, the last of the protesters were either handcuffed or fled. He estimated that they had cut around 8% of them. These were good numbers to report to the chief. One of the lieutenants approached him, his baton, baton bloodied. Are we bringing them all in for questioning or uh, selection? We aren't questioning them, Omar replied. New laws. These anti-democratic radicals are going to wish they never came here. Toss them into the prisons, and if they ask, remind them that they aren't entitled to counsel anymore. Now when they're threatening public order. The people's orders must be protected. Ah. So for this one, we definitely like this one. Power to slowly improve. I like that. More stimulation, more farming productivity. And this one lowers what? Cash crops? 23% is that... Farm productivity is up. Is that helpful here? It helps barely, but it helps a little bit. Viva Cristo Rey. The April heat smothered the small city of the Tabasco Plain. 
It was hot enough, and the streets were mostly deserted, save for a few passing trucks and a weathered old man limping down the street toward the town hall. Ramon stopped for a moment to lean on his simple wooden cane. His clothes were soaked through with sweat and clung to his body. He wiped at his forehead with a plain cloth. After a moment, he continued, biting at his cheek to distract the searing pain in his side. The bullet had ripped through his legs some four years ago, in Gu Guanajuato, but the bullet never set right. He had taken up arms when Father Emiliano had been arrested for walking to the drugstore in clerical garb. He would pay for it with every step he took until the day he died. Still, he was alive today. And that was more than many of his friends could say. He thanked the Lord for sparing him from the firing squad and hobbled on. Ooh. He had spent all morning walking back and forth across town from one government office to the other. He hoped to get permits for this parish to hold a public celebration for Easter. Every official he had met had pointed to him to a different office on the other side of town. Ever since that godless guy, Medrazo, had wormed his way into the governor's office, it had become nearly impossible to get permits to hold a Catholic event publicly. The town hall was his last hope. The four-story building loomed over him. He passed through the portico and into the lobby. There, secretary directed him to a third-floor office. There was stuffy and still, disturbed only by a cheap metal desk fan. It wasn't long before the official appeared, and Raymond could plead his case. The bureaucrat listened, and then spoke. I'm sorry, but we won't be approving any new permits for public events this month. If you're so inclined, the city of Villa Hermosa is sponsoring the Apostolic, Apostolic, Apostolic Church to a celebration of General Gardillo's, Garrido's life. Perhaps we'll attend? Raymond wanted to cave his skull in with his cane. He wanted to burn the whole city to ash. The only thing he'd do was leave in silence. All the freezing nights in the desert, all the friends he'd seen hanging from telephone poles and riding in the summer heat. All of it come to this. All of it for nothing. The old girl limped on to a future that didn't want him. Fading optimism. Your Excellency, our recent economic development efforts have fallen short. It has resulted in decline in investor confidence in several key areas. Initially, living standards are being perceived at best as stagnant and worse as declining. These unfortunate economic markers have led to an increasingly weakened domestic market. In order to save us in a situation, economic management must be prioritized. Restore faith in Mexico's growth trajectory. I mean, actions are recommended. Page 5 contains any my recommendations. Oh crap, we really failed here. Unemployment got better. The poverty got worse, which we couldn't handle. We get loose stability. Industrialist and worker loyalty decreases. The growing concerns about Mexico's economic performance have decreased stability of our, and our political influence. Crap. GDP went down. I mean, what, what, what can we do? I mean, all that crap we had to deal with in the past few episodes, it's almost impossible. GDP growth? Yeah, what do you, what, what do you want? GDP per capita? Agronomic productivity? We had no political power to spare. Like, we literally had nothing to spare. Farming productivity? Uh... Man, this is really bad for our, our, our yearly deficit. I really can't wait until we get rid of this thing. Uh-huh. Oh, to unite in love and duty. Well, Mexico enjoys cordial relations with many nations and a long year of peace to back up. They haven't come to us idly. They haven't, uh, working within at least set principles where we determine our actions without foreign interference and that of other nations' issues are their own. We promoted our own peace and prosperity and become a reliable member of the international community. After all, are we not all reasonable people? Can warfare and strife not be avoided through acknowledging the strides we have taken as a collective species and uniting as peaceful both nations? Wallowing in interference and shallow imperialism is a way of those stuck in the past, we shall take a certain pride in proceeding onwards without these things. An electoral shock. The January meeting of the MLM was meant to be simple and symbolic. The growing inertia of the party led many to believe Cardenas would announce a presidential bid. The former president had something else in mind. I'm officially announcing excited murmurs of Trump through the air that we will not be partaking in the 1964 presidential elections. Immediately, the various leaders of the party interjected in frustration. General, why would we not let me speak? The old Cardenas presidential voice rang throughout the room loud and clear. Working within the fixed, unstoppable machines that our elections in this country will get us nowhere. The irony hung in the air like poison. I know firsthand. This is it is a hollow method, and not the type of grand through support we need to challenge the CNC. He seemed to be finished, by which time one of the others spoke on, perhaps on behalf of the opposition to such a decision. Do you know, while we understand some of your reasoning, the one was blowing towards the bid in this move, it, the man paused for a moment to piece together his worries. It might cost us our membership in an irreparable way. Uh, though the rest of the room was silent, the slight nod of some of the members indicated that they might be part of that cost. Enough. The decision is already been made. I am only informing you as all is a formality. Cardenas would have his way, for better or for worse. The fate of this organization hangs in the balance. That's better, but this is very concerning for me. Oh, gosh. 
Subsidized mechanization. So, where's worker loyalty right now? Ooh, not good. We need more worker loyalty. Where's the industrial loyalty? I could make him piss him off just a little bit more to find. Quality of life will go up. For working standards. Hundred percent. Do we really want a hundred percent though? that much but it helps out at least a little bit because we definitely need that now oh there goes him have your way our thorough nurse is black eye with one hand and the assembled delegates sat and drew a plans for the next move uh, and their new code of conduct hundreds of mostly students have been arrested that have been arrested that day in chihuahua city they've been cut loose a couple days later none of the worse for wear well mostly the guy thing still stung if any lessons would be learned from all this it was that any pretense of the government's commitment to the people if it ever existed was dead and gone Left within the Constitution, Lopez Mateos' great promise of change had revealed itself for what it was, a handful of textbooks, nationalized electricity that didn't reach Dolores, in exchange for disappearances, the deprivation of the land from those who worked it, and a bit time to the face. He knew that the revolution of potential of the PRI had just been long spent, but he hoped just peasants of the Chihuahua might be able to wring just a little more out of it. No more. The Mexican Revolution had always been a halfway step, a compromise earned in blood, over which decades of false pizza had wrung out gallons more. A true revolution, one final bloodletting, structured along class lines was needed. The people of Chihuahua, the people of Mexico, would beg for concessions no longer. They would rip power from the PRIS does in gnarled claws and create a society for workers and peasants to thrive. Of course, the organization to pursue such lofty goals would need a name after a while. And a good deal of arguing, the now revolutionaries were able to decide what friends and enemies alike would call them. The Grupo Popular Guerrero, or Guer Guerrero is born. CTM meant what again? My god, I feel like a Chilean saying this, but this CTM isn't a trade union confederation. It stands for Concha du Matre, clearly. Alonso had been fired for taking part in the strikes in 1959 and sustained himself on odd jobs and ge the generosity of his neighborhood. As the Lopez Mateos administration turned on, Alonso, oh, Alonso, Alonso found he could apply for a job under the wing of the CTM, the trade union confederation of Mexico. He had a certain hope that things would be somewhat better, but the union's worthlessness made clear that he would never be the case, or that would never be the case. There's no better, no other avenue whereby workers could represent themselves to the bosses or government, a textbook monopoly situation which enabled the CTM to behave just like a corporate monopoly. Conditions never improved, but even if they worsened, the union took no responsibility. The union was so enamored with red tape that it was difficult even to get a piece of the CTM letterhead paper for personal use, let alone to respond properly if things went wrong. Worse yet, were the union bosses, all willing students of the great sellout Fidel Velasquez at the top of the CTM, who acted essentially like a sort of metal management in overalls. They all drove nice cars without fail. Ford's GMs and a few Toyotas and Fiats, they all, so, all treated the factory bosses like their own sworn brothers, sincerely fawning over them while they did likewise, right where every worker could see them. Carismo, the tradition started by El Charo, a crop trade union leader in the 40s who all but sold out his workers to the government and adhered to the army's every dictate, was alive and well. So much for the Concha de Matra, uh, Alonso thought the conditions were crap, and thanks to the so-called union state, things would never get better. With major friends. Construction would increase. Where is it? where is this modifier? The perfect dictatorship. Spirit. Leviathan. Hui. Revolutionary agriculture. Not good. Mexican miracle. Hmm. We forgot some heroes. Of GDP, I like that. But this construction will increase. American business arises, which it means nothing. Sphere business opinion arises, but not bad. 
Industrious loyalty will increase. Still positive for now. Versus bureaucrat and intelligentsia loyalty. Well, we could really use bureaucrat to be better. Loyalty here is nearly like perfect already. And more GDP. I like this one. If there's one lesson to remember about the diplomatic disarray of the Lucian Crisis, it is that the superpowers view Mexico as only another pawn in their games. Alone, our independence will always be at risk from the malign influences. But we do not and will not stand alone. Cuba and Venezuela valiantly engage in ceaseless hidden struggles to defend their revolutions and the right of their peoples to control their own destiny. While clashes between nuclear powers garner international attention, those nations, our peers, are forgotten heroes of the uh, Cold War. We'll call forth the Veracruz Forum and Mexico's legends of talented artists to give them the belated recognition they deserve and united ensure that our collective independence is stronger than ever. The beast awakens across the nation. A slumber beast had awoken. And Mexico City, registration was underway. Voters were found and were reminded of other loyalties. A worker was deficient and PRI support was threatened when he tried to organize against a militancy whose existence was to serve and benefit the Mexican worker that made good on the promise and beat him in a dark alley on his way home. In Guerrero, a PRI rally was held near a mine, the workers looking on with mild interest. Some cough, others rubbed their callous hands together and yet more wonder how much they were going to be given to a standard instead of work. At the very least, some thought it was a break from the dark depths from not, where only dust, sweat, and stone ruled. In Sonora, farmers were made to watch a rally of their own. As a respite from hard labor beneath the sweltering desert sun of northern Mexico, they were made to listen to a local party leader who gave a speech about the sacred values of the PRI and its institutions. All of them knew the consequences of going to one of those rallies along with the benefits of attending this one. And so they watched it on with mild interest, letting the smoke and mirrors of the PRI work its magic. The government and citizens, the corporations and the workers, all worked in harmony as the PRI intended. Mexico would be made to choose, choose once more, and it would be grateful for the revolution, for the party, and front line. <coughs> the sound of drill barked orders, drill and barked orders, permeated even the thick canvas of General Marcelino Garcia Barragan's command tent. The maps that covered his table were composed of thick lines of soldiery in entrenched positions. The smirk that spread across his face suggested he knew what tidings his visitors brought. Secretary of National Defense Agustin Olachea seated himself alongside General Com Gomez Huerta of the Presidential General Staff, extracting a small slip of paper from his brown leather briefcase he set at his side. Um, Olachea's hand set the paper face down on Barragan's desk with a firmness that belied their age. He lowered his eyes at the younger commander, General Barragan, you prompt action arranging arraying forces to defend the federal district exceeded our expectations. Beginning next month, you'll be receiving an increased salary. Barragan took the paper from his desk and nodded the figures before saying, I appreciate that, Secretary, though. I find myself surprised that you expected less of me. Olicha cocked an eyebrow. Uh, Synarchists sympathetic to Nava remain active in Santiago de Querataro. Uh, you and the needed force will be transferred to that military zone. Following the barest minimum of pleasantries, the Secretary took hold of his briefcase, stood and left, trailed by Gomez Huerta. After ensuring his voice would not be carried far amidst a hubbub at the camp, Olicha turned his campaign. A number of threats kept rising. Internal, external, we are stretched from Querétaro to Quintana, Quintana Roo. The Secretary for the National Defense will put together the comprehensive modernization plan, and this time we must ensure that it's funded, because the next NAVA will arrive soon enough. We're not even halfway through. How many events have we read? Oh my goodness. You can see. Work a little to improve what you do like. I don't want more inflation, though. Get more GDP, I like that. I don't like lowering our peasant loyalty, though. Mm. With the foreign partners, we'll begin to liberate the people of Latin America from the threat of nuclear war. Uh, well, I guess we'll do the ISSSTE. Our many plans and initiatives, grand as they may be, uh, are truly nothing without the many, many workers who put in the effort to make them reality. With that in mind, President Lopez Mateos believes strongly that we should do our best to take care of them, a belief which led to the creation of the Instituto de Seguridad y Servicio. Uh, servicios Sociales de los Trabajadores del Estado, an organization created with that very goal in mind. One of its new initiatives is the construction of brand new public housing facilities designed to be rented at manageable controlled rates in an effort to combat the vicious sprawl in many urban areas our workers live in, which will likely grow out of control and beyond all reasonability if left untouched. Continued development is key to this plan with a double whammy of improving the living conditions of the workers and making your cities a better place to live for all. Election season begins. Uh oh. Mexican Cross Greater Nation. Report excitement as the 1964 presidential campaign season begins. Currently, four parties are approved by the Board of Elections to contend are the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI, the Party of National Action, or PAN, 
the popular socialist party or PPS, and the party for the authentic Mexican Revolution or the PARM. These groups have entered into an electoral coalition with the PPS and PRAM, or refraining from nominating presidential candidates of their own. Our editorial board wishes to express our hope that the Mexican public engages thoughtfully and eager in the civic and democratic responsibility to ensure the wise leadership for our country. May the best candidate win. We'll see. Some more loyalty, which is good. And more political power is nice, too. We're going to give him a, uh, stuff here. The Golden Rule. Distinguishing our distinguished colleagues, Mateos began as he stared out of the rows and rows of party delegates. Royal tension has never been higher than they are today. The Japanese and Americans have only recently come within inches of disaster and saved only by cooler heads prevailing over their warmongers. The Mediterranean is brimming with the resentment and Amy just waiting to explode. Who knows what other disaster might befall the, across the world in the coming decades? Through the last few decades, Mexico has uh, followed a clear international doctrine, uh, the Estrada Doctrine. <coughs> Today, I reaffirm a commitment to these ideals. Um, the world is a complex, ever-changing landscape. It is not a right to intervene in other nations' domestic policy simply because we disagree with them. Uh, Self-determination is a cornerstone of a peaceful world order, and I will continue to support this policy throughout the Americas and beyond. In addition, I will bring these ideals of self-determination and non-intervention with me wherever I go. If other nations fall suit, then one day we might wake up to a world less ravaged by the disease of war, with a nod. Mateos indicated to those gathered that his speech was concluded, and the applause began as he clapped. Mateos made his way off the stage, joined by Ordaz. Planning any more tours abroad that I should know about, Your Excellency? Ordaz asked as they made their way out. Oh, not particularly, Mateos gave him a brief smile. I'm just hoping that this speech will smooth over any wrinkles we have with our partners. We're going to need them in the years ahead. The Americans have their doctrine, and we have ours. Yeah. Ah, uh, look how much this is going to help out. Ah, so much. Was it Nixon already impeached? Or was he removed? Or, huh? Well, whatever. Re up roll. However, much as we passionately promote and making cordial friendships with other nations, other nations, peace is something to, you must truly work for. Relationships are just one key piece of the grand puzzle, and it's about time that we move boldly forward um, and put them to use by trying to tackle one of the most insidious evils of the century, nuclear weaponry. The Reunion Primular Sobre de la Desnuclearización de la América Latina, or Reoporal, has a plan to bring together emissaries and diplomats from the nations of Latin America so that we can come together and begin discussions that hopefully will lead to a formal treaty banning Latin American nations from having nuclear weapons. It's a promising initiative. Already we've heard from Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Chile that they're interested in attending, and while it's hardly going to end the Cold War, a sense of unity in pursuing peace is exactly what we aim to project. The treaty awaits. Model student. Cuba's revolution will be our military model. Arturo Gamiset, an authoritative teacher with a dog-eared copy of Gora... Guerrero's guerrilla warfare as his only textbook. The weather bean cabin that was now a schoolhouse was filled with bean students and bitter peasants. All had learned the harsh lessons of Cadillo Control Chihuahua. While breaking the columns, as small and disciplined groups that can attack oppressors and vanish before the state's uh, forces arrive in bulk. We evade them in the Sierra until it's time to strike, demonstrating their impotence and that resistance can succeed. By breaking Kakakus, we free peasants from opposition in the short term and build the support and readiness for the true revolution. Any questions? A young veteran near the group stood, introduced himself with a blunt, Salvador Gaetan, and then continued. I'd like to volunteer to lead one of the columns. My question is, what's their first objective? Gomez took Gaetan a long, hard look, neither flinching nor looking away. Our troll nodded. The great estates of the Ibarra family are at a boiling point. With a small push, the peasants that labor on their lands would revolt against daily human humiliations and countless massacres. I'll give a column an opportunity to attack the infrastructure that sustains the Ibarra apparatus. Will we take that opportunity? Gladly, says Gaetan. It's looking better. It's not great still, but it's looking better. Build public housing, huh? Worker loyalty will increase. Well, we like more worker loyalty. We definitely like worker loyalty. Urban quality of life, huh? Mm. <coughs> um, 
we'll go this far maybe. Very nice, very nice. Any projects? Nope. Well, we're getting there. So we read that one. What about driving away the specters? The poor, rural poor of Mexico, while decreasing over the past years due to literacy programs, disease eradication, and land reform efforts, still make up an uncomfortable share of the nation's population. Though great strides have been taken and successors have been considered, we mustn't sit idly by while poverty infests the countryside of Mexico. An action at a time like this would prove fatal for their already tenuous PRI regime, so making moves against rural poverty would let a lot of people know that we carry the ideas of the revolution, ensuring our continued electoral popularity. Census. The Undersecretary for Industry and Commerce reclined his chair back, reclined his chair back, allowing it, uh, the level two inches and took a deep breath of recycled air. It was currently on a direct flight from Mexicali back to the Federal District. Carefully placed in the empty seat next to his, his was a briefcase that contained the fruits of weeks of nightmarish bureaucratic labor. It had been torturous work arranging an economic development strategy for the Baja California and Baja California Sur. Every person the PRI bureaucrats spoke to agreed that the region had tremendous potential, but excruciatingly, every person had their own vision of how that potential was going to be fulfilled. The big city scraped to be the center point. Baja California Sur is fighting for its fair share despite its insignificant population. American, Japanese, and Mexican industrials are jockeying for the best contracts. Uh, Norteños wanting all the federal money but none of the strings. Look at this guy. Oh. The debates in politics might have been bearable if all the par involved parties could fit into one room. However, the undersecretary had spent the last couple of weeks on a journey of to the westernmost extremes of Mexico. He traveled on terrible roads to tiny towns and small farms, meaning the people who would be most impeached or impacted by his uh, policy decisions. It was a grueling journey, but miraculously he had done it. He crafted a perfectly acceptable plan that everybody could sign, filled with manageable compromises and minimal loopholes. It was a defining moment of his career, a testament to the PRI's commitment to carrying forward the legacy of the revolution for Baja and all of Mexico. Care for a drink, sir? An air stewardess interrupted his item musing. Don't mind if I do, the harried man replied, plucking a glass of cheap, sparkling wine from the woman's outstretched hands. As a cold drink touched his tongue, all the painful memories floated away, leaving him only him and his briefcase. The revolution's light touched all corners of Mexico. What is this? Oh. Oh, crap. We should have been doing this the entire time. Perception. Construction. Sell. El tapado. Oops, I should have been doing this for a while. Uh, prevents perception prepared preparation from being subtracted upon the completion of the current focus. Only one perception can be chosen for this effect until the current focus is completed. It costs a lot of political power. Increase the perception preparation by two. Construction preparation. Help influential PRI members adjust to El tapado. Prevents construction preparation from being subtracted upon the completion of the current focus. Only one preparation can be chosen for this effect until the current focus is completed. Familiarize El Tapado with the affairs of the state. Legacy. Cat Revens kiss babies. Free non threatening political prisoners. Why does it cost so much political power to do all this? Holy crap. Target faction loyalty? Out of loyalty, power, and corruption, only one may be targeted for focus of this faction. Perception campaigns must be activated for this effect. So we can do this one, and then if we do that one, it won't lower it. Uh, preparedness by one. It says legacy. Hmm. 
Interesting. I don't know, probably screwing this up a little bit. 30, 45, 30. All right, so make sure I read this first. Legacy and construction perception. The biological uh, factors for El Tapado secure before the beginning of the presidency, and the president must do all he can to ensure this happens. Raising these above 60 will ensure a peaceful transition of power upon succession, yet above 80 will secure El Tapado as the next great statesman of the United Mexican States. Raising these variables is done through campaigns. To activate a campaign, a lever must be pulled once there is five preparation for that campaign. Once the lever is pulled, five of the campaign's variable will be generated upon the completion of that focus. Huh. However, completing a focus will also subtract three preparation from a ra random campaign, active or inactive. Following an active campaign's preparation to hit zero will deactivate it, forcing preparation to be built back up. This is kind of complicated. I don't really understand that. What? Completing a focus. Subtract three preparation. Well, whatever, I guess. The top bully. Ordaz found Echeverria in his office, carefully sorting a stack of papers. Diligent as always, he thought as the door closed behind him. Echeverria glanced up from his work the moment the door was closed and stood on as he looked to the newly chosen president of Mexico. Your Excellency, congratulations on your recent victory. The people of Mexico will be well served with you at the helm. Echeverria adjusted his glasses as he spoke, trying to look a little more in order than his mind was. Ordaz guessed. He can only imagine what sorts of reports the man had been reading only moments ago with the rabble rousers and malcontents stirring up trouble left and right. Ordaz approached the desk as he spoke. Thank you. It's an honor to serve in such a distinguished position. In the years ahead, I will need my good, able bodied men to help steer Mexico towards a prosperous future. In my time work along, working alongside you, I'll come to no other man more qualified to keep order and peace in our streets. I would like you to stay on as Secretary of the Interior once I assume my office. At Chaveria smiled, it would be a privilege to serve you in your administration, Your Excellency. You and I agree on quite a lot. Especially when it comes to keeping order on our streets, I'll continue to serve Mexico's best interests. The newly elected president gave Echeverria a small smile. Then I see no reason to further interrupt your work. I'd like a report on your operations by the end of the week. With that, or dials off the office. Even if his administration would be filled with new faces, he at least had one trusted familiar face to help him govern. Old blood mingles with the new. Oops, apologies of all, the lieutenant was only there to take notes. And he took notes he took, capturing and treasuring every utterance with more careful than Diaz del Castillo had put into the account of conquest. Because of the men, the legends gathered here in the federal district, perhaps for the last time, were sharing how the revolution had been won, and what the what that should mean for the Mexico of tomorrow. Uh, General Fierro Villalobos was wrapping up the same principles that drove my success with the General Callas, dr that drove the success of the recent Air Force modernization plan, that likewise would drive the success of a full modernization of our armed forces in the years ahead. Uh, first, we must take the latest arms and latest lessons from global conflicts and firmly adapt them to a Mexican context. Bombing innovations from the First World War were essential to the free General Obregón from the Yaqui, but hell, targeting had to be broad and substantial given the tribe's greater mobility. Second, new capabilities need to be made known across all arms of the military rather than only the specialists that wield them. During the Escobarista Rebellion, General Callas needed and received absolute faith in her bombing capabilities to make a river crossing covered by air alone. I'm not sure similar trust exists today. Lastly, we must expand and deepen our military schooling to disseminate doctrinal and technological advances further into our forces. A few bright spots no longer cover the lagging mean. General Oro Paisa and Escobar Diaz gave firm nods before turning their attention to the waiting Secretary of National Defense, General Olache. He gave a slight nod of his own before replying. The reference to the Yaqui is apt. Our enemies will take many forms over the coming decades, but mobility and sustained firepower will be key to their defeat. Strengthening offensive operations will take precedence. Our force will not always have the luxury of the positions at Nako. Every glorious pencil can be won with a sweat and blood. Resource extraction. Loosen labor's laws. All that base stimulation is not bad. Um, in the southwest. It's fine, whatever. Five look power and five perception. Let's 
just can't do anything there. So we did that, we're gonna really increase that a lot. I really don't know. Exercising the atom. First, he made his way over to the window to gaze out of the streets of Mexico City. Then he made his way over to the desk to rearrange some files and other assortments that litter the surface. Oh my god, there's so much reading here. Whatever Mateos did, he couldn't quite quell the restlessness stirring within him. The Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Manuel Taylor Borral, had promised to be here at 10. Mateos' eyes flickered over the, to the clock hanging on the wall and he saw the small hand a hair's breadth away from the large tent. It wasn't exactly right, even if a small part of it didn't work out. Your Excellency, Borral is here to see you. The voice of his secretary cut through his thoughts and rushed him back under the reality. Send him in. Barad entered and upon seeing Mateos smiled widely and reached out a hand. Your Excellency, is there something I can do for you? Mateos returned the warm handshake, his nerves calming somewhat. Yes, yeah, on a few matters. I'd like you to begin working on a setting up a meeting of as many Latin American nations as you can get on board. That's small? What is this meeting for exactly? Trade talks? Barad's face fell only slightly. Denuclearization, Mateos answered. This will be my semi my seminal foreign policy achievement, Barad. I want to denuclearize Latin America, and I'm going to hold a conference to ensure that we can keep this kind of safe from that sort of Armageddon. Broad did not reply instantly, letting Mateos' words hang in the air for a few moments as he considered their proposal. Finally, he answered, well, it's a bold, and probably get a few on board. We'd have to wrangle a few others, but it's daring enough to get their attention at the very least. I'll make a few calls. What will this conference be called? Riapro. Not great. That got worse. Jesus Christ, why does this have to be so tough now? Senator Best Friend. Ordaz had a little free time outside his double-digit work, hour work, a fact that he held dearly to himself and his work ethic, so he made sure to cherish a little time after his work that he had to himself. While he would normally dread a visit to another politician after hours to talk matters of state, the statesman in question that day could be considered an exception. Ordaz happily entered the office of Emiliano or Emilio Martinez Manautao, renowned former surgeon, senator from Tamaulipas, believer in the revolution, and Ordaz's best friend. Gustavo, how goes the future president of Mexico? Sharing a quick hug with one of the few men he could work to do so with, Ordaz quickly came to the good news. All according to plan thus far, Emilio, though I believe it's your day uh, that is about to get better, Senator. Ma Manautu acted curious to Ordaz's next words, though his day had been in the works for years, and knew what came next. How does Secretary of the Presidency sound, Emilio? Though um, Manautu knew a promotion was on the table, he was still surprised at the cabinet offer from Ordaz concerning his reformist leanings. Well, Gustavo... Uh, a look of mild concern flashed on his face. Secretariat? What about our, our dogs? Cut him off. Differences in opinion, the senator nodded. Though I run more conservative than you, Emilio, that does not preclude you from my administration. What matters is that you are dedicated and loyal to the party and loyal to Mexico. Manal, too, looked relieved. Gustavo, I accept your offer. He offered his hand, which Ordaz quickly, gladly shook. Thank you. A true friend and worthy advisor was I to Adolfo. Rallying the masses. How many more calls do we need? Carmen asked, her hands gingerly wrapped around a cup of coffee she was nursing. Isabel, another one of the callers, was hunched over by the water cooler, filling up a star from a cup of her own. Uh, for each one of one, each one of us, Isabel asked as she glanced back at Carmen, about 400, give or take, depending on how quick you've been. It may seem a lot, but trust me, it'll be easier next election. But, the, may, but must we make so many calls? I'm sure the other sectors are taking things a bit slower. What differences does one 100,000 versus a few thousand make? The other parties are never going to match a PRI's turnout. It just seems excessive, don't you think? Um, Isabel said, you really don't know, do you? She didn't wait for a reply. When the corporate central calls on the Confederations, it's our job to answer. The CTM, CNC, CNOP, it doesn't matter. Our boss gets that call and we get on the phone, call up our members and get them out into the streets. As many as we can get, the goal isn't to fill those rallies or mobilize just enough for the PRI. The goal is to overwhelm them. Uh, drench them in the tsunami of our membership while crying for the PRI's chosen name. But isn't that a little disingenuous? Oh, sweet girl, Isabel reached a hand over to delightfully squeeze her shoulder. You worry too much. Just focus on your job. Enjoy your paycheck at the end. No drink up. You got 400 more calls to make. With central calls, the workers answer. Real quality of life goes up, huh? Stimulation. And what are we looking at? Southwest. Represent loyalty. Let's get a bit loyal. The Argentine snub. The conference hall was packed with delegates from all over Latin America. The chimes, glasses, and plates were ringing as they enjoyed the amenities Barad had organized. Mateos looked on as they chatted among themselves, trying his best to smile through their disappointment, aching in his heart. 
Uh, he could see the empty table to his right, just out of the corner of his eye, where the Argentinian delegation should have been sitting. It had been too late to reorganize the venue by the time they had gotten words so now the table stood as memorial to Mateos' failure. Something on your mind? Mateos had heard a voice ask, and when he glanced over, he saw Janino Janio Quadros, the president of Brazil, standing beside him. We all may have agreed to denuclearization, but if this ban isn't extended to Argentina, I worry about its future. Um, there ought to have been guarantees, but if we had those, then Colombia would have argued with Ecuador and Venezuela about what those sorts of guarantees would be, and then Mateo took a sharp breath as a twinge of pain shot its way through his skull. Uh, I think you worry too much. You've done a great thing here. We've all agreed on the broad principles of keeping nuclear weapons out of Latin America. Without you, the superpowers would have free range of a strong arm any of us in a swallowing Latin America to become the playground of their weapons of mass destruction. I think that's something to celebrate at the very least. Um, was that what he thought the agreement had meant? Mateos' heart had slipped into his stomach. Uh, this whole thing had to truly denuclearize a continent. It, it was just not meant to keep the superpowers out. Yet, uh, when Mateo started by arguing against the Brazilian, all he could feel was a crescendo of pounding in his skull. I heartily agree, Your Excellency. So uh, that's getting worse, but that'll make this look better eventually. So, Oh, Speer won. Look at that. Good job, Speer. And we'll do that one next, and then after that, uh, our base industries. Yeah. Mexico is a beautiful land awash with resources simply waiting to be properly used by the people for their own benefit. A realization that has flared our economy to new heights and resulted in something of an economic miracle. In a facility in the extraction of these resources, we put a new focus on our mining and extraction efforts, and the fruits of our labor are em eminently obvious. We now drink deeply from a supply of steel and oil that we do not have to grovel to for any nation any other nation for, and make a tidy profit from selling to other nations as if it wasn't go going good enough already. The success story here speaks for itself, and we should continue to buckle down and further develop these mining sectors. The goal, after all, is upwards, and we are ready to climb up as fast as our efforts will take us as a strong figure of trade on the world stage. The Gringo Whispers Antonio Carrillo Flores cut through the tender beef steak until his knife squeaked against the ceramic plate. Ordaz watched him carefully, even as Flores casually glanced around the restaurant packed with men and women, enjoying a warm lunch. He knew the game that Flores was playing. He knew exactly why Ordaz had called him here, but not want to appear too grateful. That was fine. Ordaz could play the game, too. Senor Flores, I'm sure you know why I've asked you to join me for lunch. Ordaz left his plate untouched as he waited patiently for the ambassador to reply. You called me here because you're deciding who will be your secretaries, and my name came up. Flores had another bite of his steak as he finally looked to Ordaz. I want you to serve as the head of the Secretariat of External Relations. You've been ambassador to the U.S. for many years and have close relations with them. I'm going to need your connections in the years ahead if I'm going to improve our relationship. I'm sure you and I can agree that they are our longest and most trusted partners, and furthering economic and diplomatic ties with them will not only further the benefit of the Mexican people. Flores and I immediately replied, much to Ordaz's annoyance. He continued to eat a steak as one of uh, Ordaz's hands curled tightly around his fork. I accept. Your faith will not be misplaced, Your Excellency. I'll get you those close relations with the U.S. You don't have to doubt me on that. Ordaz felt his body relax at finally having secured his cooperation. We'll do great things in the world stage together, you and I. An amiable beginning. We do like that, I guess. I don't know. I'm gonna go back and redo this anyway, so. The car jolted as it went over a pothole. The meet and greet of the Waxaca was doing no favors for Lopez Mateos' backside, nor for the car's suspension. The unpaved roads reminded him that despite being in the same nation, the people of Oaxaca lived an entirely different life than the people of Mexico City. Looking outside the tinted windows, the land and people of Oaxaca were entirely untouched by the Mexican Revolution. They lived in the same squalors of parents and par their parents before them. People carried carts via horsepower or by hand, with mules being more likely to occupy the roads in a car. Despite the rampant poverty that surrounds him, he thought to himself that it must have been much worse prior to his term. Fewer children were on the streets and more were now in school. With those children now having textbooks of their own, rather than needing to share the same ripped books that have been passed down through the years, some progress was being made, but not enough. Lopez Mateo gripped the car, car, car seat to help cushion him against all the jerking of the car. He made a mental note of what ought to be done to uplift the poor. The people in whose name the revolution was carried out are now being neglected. Although he had put a dent in the dilapidation of the poor states, there was more to be done by the end of his term and beyond to finish the job. In the middle of a thought, the car had another pothole and jounced, forcing Lopez Mateos' head to collide with the roof. First, we need to fix these darn roads. Progress at Penpoint. 
A gloved hand rapped loudly on the industrial metal door. After a moment, a short man, decades into a hair loss journey, heaved the door open. Good morning. We're looking for the owner of this factory. Can I presume that you are Mr. Ramirez? A pair of men with the clipboards announced. They wore crispy army uniforms, but their boots were caked with dust. Evidence of a day spent shuffling around factory floors and the streets of Pueblo. Once it was civil servants and civilian bureaucrats who had managed and informed public policy, but in the new Castillo administration, the military ran almost all aspects of government. I own this factory, yes? How can I help you, gentlemen? It's perfect, you see, Mr. Ramirez. We represent the local state government office, and we're here to inform you that you are eligible for a tax rebate as part of the new program by Governor Castillo. The officer pulled out a pamphlet and handed it to the factory owner. The pamphlet listed a number of new machines and technologies that, while expensive, would significantly modernize any manufacturing process. Within, you'll see several items you may purchase and file with the local council to earn your tax credit. If you have any questions, you can contact the council in industrial pro uh, pro progress. The council, Ramirez shouted, you want me to work with those thugs? All that so-called council represents is the combined interests of all the corrupt oligarchs, businessmen, landowners, and conservative currents that your commanding officers could scrounge together. The Ramirez threw the pamphlet back into the officer's face. All men watched as the cheap paper booklets tumbled to the dirty ground. Everything was silent except for the whirling of machinery within the busy factory. Ramirez flinched as the officer slowly reached into his jacket towards his holster. But instead of a gun, he pulled out a pen and pad. If you have any complaints, sir, I'll, sh I'll be sure to write down your name and information. Hit and sprint. Salvatore Gaetan stayed only for a moment, just long enough to feel the rush of hot air on his skin, hear the crack of the dynamite. The bridge crumbled into the ravine only in the corner of his eye because the satchel of the explosives was on his back and his legs were pumping down the gravel path. <coughs> uh, charging downhill. He could see the fruits of his sabotage of Gamiza's propaganda. Thousands of peasants burning Ibarra fields, looting their opulent manners. Good, if his cell could blow one more bridge. Oh boy. Thump, 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 thump. With the sound of his legs pounding. Uphill now. Pannons get you closer to the next target. His comrades should have already been there. He should have already been there, and then he heard the cracks of rapid fire and the shouts and screams. Two Ibarra trucks across the unblown bridge, one in front of a flat tire. Good thinking. Four GPG men who had uh, bought him that town were lying dead, bone fragments and blood smeared across the dirt. Pablo Gomez behind a tree, safe. Where were the others? With the loudest battle cries, wind and lungs could muster. Uh, Salvatore threw himself behind a rock, came up, shot. One thug at the front dro bumper dropped. Fired again, another yelped, ram. Third time, a bald goon punched through the chest. As he crouched to reload, uh, he heard the squeal of a rear truck being thrown into reverse. The Ibarra's men were shouting, helping a board or fleeing into the woods. Salvatore shot three more times at vanishing assailants, at murders of peasants and friends. Then, as his head cleared and a reminder of his cell emerged from the trees, he stood, got the, the sticks of dynamite from his satchel, and got back to work. First blood, drawn. Well, that's not good. That's really bad. That's really, really not good. Anything else we do here, though? No? Okay. Nation's protector. I want you to be ahead of the Secretary of National Defense, Oda says. He and Marcelino Garcia's Barragan sat comfortably in the newly elected president's sitting room. Fire crackled from the fireplace nearby, illuminating the otherwise dark, otherwise dark room. Oh, it's green. Thank goodness. I would be honored to serve your excellency in such a capacity. Our national security is paramount, especially in times such as these. The little general leaned back into his chair, taking a small sip of his whiskey. Conflict surrounds us all over this hemisphere and beyond. Fascists, communists, and radicals of every stripe. We need a strong hand that can crush through all these radicals and protect Mexico's interests here and beyond. Ordaz could see the general steadily nodding along from the edge of his vision. His fingers curled against the arm of the chair, holding back a biting remark. Battlegun was in a notorious turncoat. There's no other way to put it. He served with Pancho Villa for a time before scuttling his way to defect to the Constitutionalists. He helped Alvaro Obregón overthrow the sitting president in 1920 before aligning with the leftist Enriquez Enriquistas. He tried to plan a coup in 1953, which went nowhere, and yet some other party chose to allow him back into the fold. A self-purported changed man who was now a staunch opponent of the very men he had served only a decade ago. Untrustworthy to be sure, but Ordaz could use it to his advantage. Ordaz sank back into his own chair, turning to stare at the fireplace crackling as the wood was eating away by the flames. General, before I officially name you, I want you to promise me one thing, that you will follow my directives and, above all, help me keep Mexico safe from its enemies. There was barely a breath between Ordaz's question and Baragán's reply. No matter the cost, Mexico will be secure. Vengeance uh, The scars on Rafael's arm, weaving between the goosebumps, had not been those of a coward. Rafael challenged El Ozo to a knife fight, and won. He cracked plenty of peasant skulls. The Ibarra family did not hire weaklings had been ready to shoot as many as needed when Carlos had pulled up outside the bar and told him, him and Perlon that Ibarra's estate was burning. Now he, Carlos, and eight others were stumbling through the dark woods, jumping at every owl's hoot and broken twig. There was a safe house on the other side, a hilltop Ibarra residence with a high stone wall and a radio station. 
So that was a call for help, then hold there until they got the numbers to break up the riding peasants to get back payback for Pelon. As Raphael's feet started up the slope of the safe house, his mind went to Pelon's final moments. They roared across a bridge in a truck, peasants taking haphazard shots on them. But these peasants did not run when he shot one. Peasants that cried out captain as one div dived out of nowhere, pumping lead into Pelon and some other CEO. Who were those peasants? Raphael could smell smoke. His feet, tired feet quickened, then broke into a jog. As he crossed the hill, breaking the tree line, he could see the flicker of flames engulfed in the safe house. To his left, Carlos shouted something, and Raphael reached for his gun. Who the heck were these peasants? Salvatore Gaetan and the Grupo Popular Gorelero answered with three bullets to his chest. <coughs> Laying the rules. The room was cool as the world air conditioning unit worked its chill into the air. Having finally selected the leadership for the state utility companies, Ordaz had ordered his cabinet assembled. The men gathered at this table would, for the next six years, help cement its legacy. First, they had to know what was expected of them. Yeah. You can read this one again, please go ahead. Yeah. Did I read this one? Yeah. I've gathered you all here to set the ground rules of your work through the courses of my administration. First and foremost, you are here to tell me the truth no matter what. I'll not abide lies meant to make you sound more competent than you actually are. To properly govern, I must know the reality of the situation. Secondly, do not apologize to me if you want to come, if you come up short. Apologies mean nothing. Results are what I care about. Thirdly, if you break the law, if you need to break the law to get things done, do it. But don't tell me. Don't let me find out. Fourth, be careful of what you tell me when I ask for reports. I do not need to be pampered with glowing reports. I do not bend to flatter easily. Be concise, honest, and competent. If you remember nothing else of this meeting, remember those words. Ordaz looked around the room and saw one, some of the faces surrounding him, nodding with understanding. Others were completely unreadable. They would do better. One a look of concern, it was he who spoke up. Your Excellency, I do have one question. What happens if we don't meet these expectations? Will you replace us? Ordaz gave him a cold stare as the only sound in the room was the air conditioner whirling by the window. After he let the fear of his response slowly fill in the room, he gave his answer, I will not change my cabinet. You do not change a horse in the middle of the river, but have other ways to punish ineptitude. Mexico's, oh, we'll read again anyways. Mexico is a beautiful land awash with resources, simply waiting to be properly used by its people for their own benefit. A realization that has been flared our economy to new heights and resulted in something of an economic miracle. In facilitating the extraction of these resources, we put new focus on our mining and extraction efforts and the fruits of our labor are eminently obvious. We now drink deeply from a supply of oil and steel that we do not have to grovel of any, any other nation for and make a tidy profit from selling to other nations as if it wasn't going good enough already. Success here, story, success speaks for itself. We should continue to buckle down and further develop these mining sectors. The goal, after all, is upwards, and we are ready to climb up as fast as our efforts will take us as a strong figure of trade on the world stage. The Tlateloco example. The concrete structure rose high in the sky with equidistant gaps arranged in rows stretching out towards the end of the city block. Those rows would all eventually be rooms for men, women, and children to live their lives and make their own. The structure still had a long way to go. There were many more months left until the building would be habitable, uh, but Mateos could already imagine those holes in the structure teeming with life as the citizens of the city made it their home. He turned to the engineer running the whole operation and gave a smile just as a flash of a press camera caught the moment. You've done a wonderful job here. You and your men have done marvelous work creating this structure as efficient as you have. As well within budget, I can assure you this sort of organizational planning will be used for the projects like this in the near future. Thank you, Your Excellency, the engineer grinned. I'm just doing my job, sir. Mateos then turned towards the press, all of whom had their pens and notebooks out, ready to scratch down whatever words came next. The tla le, lo, oh my God, the Tlateloco habitational unit will represent a new era for Mexico City. With the grand progress that is the ISSSTE is making in this construction, I'm proud to announce that this building, along with other ISSSTE buildings being built across this great city, will soon become key parts of the ever-developing landscape of Mexico City. Thank you for your time. Building the homes of the future today. But I'll end it there because this has gone long enough. And honestly, like even the comments said, we barely get through. We get through a year. Like in four or five episodes, which is great. I love reading a lot, but sometimes it can be a lot. But regardless, I um, hope you enjoy what we had for this episode. If you did, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue on with good old Mexico, and hopefully we can figure out how we can improve the standing of El Tapado. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.